Welcome to Lift Your Leg. This is Monique Canstey from Victoria, BC, from the Naughty Dog and author of As a Dog Thinketh. And Jill Brown from Calgary, Alberta, the bag lady. Today we get to talk about training tips for trial. I have a trial coming up shortly. I think Jill does too, so we're both in that mode right now. My first thing is it's really hard to keep seeing big picture when there's a little problem here and a little problem there. And we must always remember how many points we're aiming for and how many points each thing is worth that we're struggling with. We have to still focus on our training for everything, not just obsessing on one or two points here or there. Agreed. CKC obedience is much different than IPO that, that you're doing with the point breakdown. We tend to have each individual exercise is a huge number. Yours, I think, is broken down a little bit more within the exercise, is it not? But think of a sit-stay or stand for exam. There's still certain exercises we just don't train as much as we probably should. Absolutely. And we need to remember every single thing, every single point that's there, and not just train our favorites. One thing I have done in the past was have a spreadsheet with all the little exercises that I need to be working on just to keep me honest. Sorry. Jill's just, busy writing. I was just writing down a thought I had. One of the big things I think that people neglect to train is the very beginning of your trial, which is your ring entrance. Not really. There's a lot to do before that, but going into the ring is a big thing that we neglect. A lot of dogs have zero experience with walking through gates with a table there and you get to a trial and ask them to do that. And that can be enough to blow their little minds. They're not only walking through the gates, they have to walk through a bunch of people and dogs around them as well as they're getting to those gates. So that's some things that you can do with your group of training friends or in class. Every time I am training Harry, and this starts right from the beginning, maybe not the very beginning, but as a very young dog, I am teaching him my entries onto the field, into the ring, just so he starts learning it right away. And I'm talking to my imaginary judge. In your case, hand your leash to your imaginary judge. Just get them used to all of those little things that they will be seeing. Yeah. Handing off your dumbbell is a big one. There's so many people I watch that have to hand their dumbbell to the steward or the judge behind their back. <laughs> because if they hand it out in front of them, the dog is leaping through the air, snatching at it. Which takes me to train your non-pointable exercises almost as much as you train your pointed exercises because the setups, the getting from point A to point B, being able to take a dumbbell from your judge, being able to throw it, all of these pieces aren't scored, but they're just as valuable because if your dog's out of control, you're not going to do well at that exercise or if your dog freaks out with it, you're failing that exercise. These are the pieces that will affect the mood of your dog for the upcoming exercise. So your non-pointable exercises need to be focused on just as much as the scored ones. Yeah, I, I was going to say, although they're not pointable as in an exercise, there's always that um, uncontrolled can't remember what it, what it says on the score sheet, but there's they can take points off for the dog not being in control. So that leap for the dumbbell or that running to get the dumbbell if it's a bad throw rather than having to wait for the next throw, those are all things that the judges can deduct points for. You made me think something there, which is slightly off topic because this is just basic training, but train for the unexpected too. Make sure you can throw your dumbbell over the jump and it bounces to the extreme left or right and your dog knows to go take it and still come back over the jump yep. that's I teach that again when they're young just with cookies squeeze um string cheese so it's white you can see it yeah yeah we do that a lot in classes as well but I, I do believe it's something that's forgotten a lot of the time especially the extreme throws I, I think it's common for people when they're training to want to land that dumbbell in a good spot. That's yeah. what you're aiming for when you're in the ring, but it doesn't always happen that way. So you need to 
you need to have those extreme off throws. Make sure you can throw your dumbbell in a straight line on different floor surfaces. So your dumbbell is going to bounce on different footings. Know what you're throwing onto and how it's going to land. Practice that. Another is your dog needs to see trial picture in advance. And there's many different pieces involved in trial picture. But one of them is training naked. And by that, please don't undress yourself. However, <laughs> do take your all equipment off your dog. All his collars off. Empty your pockets of any food. If you wear a training vest, ditch it. If you have toys on you, get rid of them. Go in a normal shirt and pants like you're going to go in in the trial and go do a healing pattern. See what you have. Make sure your dog is used to seeing you in trial wear. We won't say naked. In trial wear and they are the same and see what see where you're at. I don't do this too often, but it's definitely my, something my dog is seeing on a regular basis so that he remembers it. For sure. It's almost getting annoying now, but silence is golden. And by that, what I'm meaning here is Harry needs to see me go in, talk to my judge, whether he's there or not, go to my spot, be formal how I'm going to need to be in trial, and then do go the distance of my healing pattern without saying a word or telling him he's good. Sometimes I'm then going into my next two exercises before I'm giving him any feedback, talking to him. Then when I do give him feedback, if I'm praising him, it's going to be explosive. It's not just going to be, good boy, Harry. Like, he knows I'm leaping out of position. He's coming with me. So it's a full-on get him in drive in that moment. Then stand up tall, pause, continue on with your pattern. So in those moments, if you're going to speak to them, make it count. But they need to go the distance. Sometimes he has to do his full healing pattern with zero rewards. Sometimes he has to do his full healing pattern and then the next three exercises with no rewards. I'm not doing that all the time, obviously, or I'll lose all my accuracy and attitude. But it is something he's seeing on a weekly basis yep. right now as I have a trial close. Stays are another big one. And I find that when we're doing stays, we spend so much time putting distractions in there, like with toys or balls being thrown or dumbbells, what have you. Um, you're always giving the dog something else to think about while they're doing their stays. Then you get in the ring and it's all of a sudden silent and nothing is happening. Nobody's giving them anything else to think about. And that can be enough to weird a dog out and have them break their stay because they've never seen it before. So make sure along with your distracted stays, you're doing silent ones as well. Another thing going here with go the distance is for Harry, I realized I had an issue when I wasn't giving him feedback for minor errors too. So if he makes a minor error in training, I'm going to guide him with it, make it right. I had to show him trial picture of allowing that minor error, allowing the next minor error, allowing the next minor error, at which point I'm twitching, and then get on him big time for the fourth error, which at that point in time is going to be much bigger because he just got away with the first three. It's important that he sees that and knows that I'm not always going to let every minor thing, that I'm not going to help him with every minor thing. Sometimes I'm going to allow it and allow it and then get on his case. I think that also will help with the dogs that are sensitive to making errors. I had one dog that if she missed a front, the rest of her trial was off. And I didn't even do anything to tell her it was off. But if she came in and went directly to heal, then she knew that she had messed up and it bothered her through the rest of the trials. Letting them get away with those little mistakes sometimes will benefit you further on we're talking about going the distance so that my dog's seeing trial picture but obviously I can't train him like that every day or I'm just going to break down all my accuracy and all my attitude is going to just fall apart so he needs to see it regularly but daily in my training I'm still showing him trial picture and that I'm training the beginning the middle and the end of every exercise so for my retrieves, for example, I'm 
I have to take my dumbbell off a stand. So I'm healing up, getting my dumbbell. I will probably reward that piece. Then I'm going to go and fake throw it, reward that piece. Then I'm going to hold him by his collar, throw his dumbbell, get him barking like a nuthead. Then just say, sit, let go of his collar, and then tell him, take it. So he's now done the formal retrieve part of the very beginning. And now he's actually done the retrieve. When he's coming back, I'm probably going to throw my second toy to my, through my legs. Once he's running around, I'm telling him how clever he is with his dumbbell and his other toy. I'll just back up and say, here. And then I'm working on my front and I'll take it and do a finish. So he just worked on every single piece of that exercise without it all being one long, boring exercise that's just going to deteriorate over time. Another thing we want to work on is your connection with your dog when you're going from one exercise to another, especially after release and praise. Some dogs have a hard time getting back into that working mode. So that's something else you can work on in your training. So you'll get a release with praise. I wouldn't use food there because it takes away from your trial picture. But release and praise and then back into heel position and you have to go to the next exercise under control and paying attention. Whether it's completely in heel position, that's up to you depending on the dog. But they have to have that connection. Again, is training the non-pointables um, do this every single session so that they used to moving from point A to point B and they know what to expect. Yeah, for sure. I'm very aware with Harry of his emotion with each exercise and I want to keep it peak for that exercise, whatever it may be. It's not always possible, but that's at least my goal. If I see his emotion going down, which it is on one exercise right now, that's the piece I'm working on to try and get that emotion up. Because if he's feeling good about the exercise, he's probably going to do it correctly. However, that didn't work last week. But in theory, that's the way it goes. So when he was coming down in drive and attitude, I just that was the piece I worked on, was just keeping him there before I actually focused on that exercise. Be mindful of their mood, their emotions, going into each exercise and how they are performing with each, within each exercise. And learn how to read them. Because for each dog, it's different. It may be a slight drop in the tail. It might be ears coming down. I had one dog that in her signals, if I turned around to face her, if her ears weren't up in an alert position, I was getting no signals. And oftentimes, even in the ring, it would just take me hesitating for a second or two, and then her ears would come up with almost a, what are you wanting next? And once her ears were up, she was in that right state of mind that I would get the signals from her. With my Italian greyhound back when I was teaching her signals, it was very difficult. Lying down for her with her skinny, deep chest on cold concrete was very challenging for her. So once she went down, it was really hard to get her back up into a sit. I had pasted ears. She looked like a beaten little Italian greyhound. So once again, focus on the mood. I needed to change her mood from a down to make her active again to get her up into a sit. So we taught her from downing to go into a sit. She had to bark. So my sit signal became a bark signal. She would and to bark, she had to hop up to do it. So granted, I lost my two points on her sit, but it's much better than losing all the points. So the bark cost me, but it allowed me to get that exercise in the mood that she needed to be in and to ultimately get her title too. So always focus on that mood. Yep. Um, I'm seeing something you've written here that I'm in. If you're trying to teach your dog something like Mandy, her signals, that, that sit part, and it was a struggle for a long time with me communicating it to her and her trying to understand what I was trying to communicate. So with that, I ended up always doing a sit signal before bed. Just in the house, I'd put her in a down. I would give her sit signal. She'd bark, jump up into her sit. I'd Praise her, reward her, we'd go to bed. 
But just letting that be the last thing that they do before bed, they se seem to learn it way faster. I was going to say, then you got the rest of the night for them. That's the last thing they thought about. And that may make a difference to them, having, having that last thought in their head. Sandy Washburn, hi if you're listening, had told me once when I got to a trial, what she did and what she suggested I do was take my dog out, let them have a walk around, get used to the area. Then if there's anything that you think might be an issue, work on that nice and close in. And when the dog nails it, reward, and they go in their kennel. So the same thing, they're going into their kennel where they can just, that can be the last thing they did and succeeded at. And that can be the last thing they're thinking about. Good advice. Sometimes getting to trial, like when it's coming up close, it's incredibly daunting, like everything that you need to be working on right beforehand. And you can't have these big long sessions because you're just going to fatigue your dog and make them hate your sport. So your training needs to be short. I'm finding I just do tiny little pieces often. So there's a jump set up in my yard. I'll go outside, just throw his dumbbell over, bring him back over the jump. There, done. I've just done that exercise. So it's just teeny tiny little pieces often. So fit it into your lifestyle rather than having these big long training sessions that I'm just going to bore both of you. Another thing I just thought of that often happens at trial is somebody doesn't check in. You're the next dog to go in the ring. You pull out your dog. You get them all warmed up. You're ready to go. And then the person shows up. Now, some of the judges are good and they will make that person wait. Sometimes not. So it's not a bad idea to bring your dog out, warm them up, put them away, and then bring them out again five, ten minutes later and still ask for that same kind of commitment to the job you're asking. Another exercise we do in class is have everyone just hanging out, chatting. No one's allowed to be luring their dog with food or anything else. Their dogs just have to be relaxed. And I say a person's name and that person then has to go to a healing pattern. So they have no chance to prep their dog, to warm their dog up. It's like from cold, they just have to be able to go and heal off. Yeah or they have that 10 feet from where they're sitting to the start, you have to learn how you can get your dog into work mode in those 10 feet. That's often something you need to do for runoffs as well. Cause yeah. you, you don't have a lot of time to warm up when you get called for a runoff. Knowing we need to teach our dogs to work for us fully, even when we're distracted too. This I learned from Dee Dee Rose, so thank you, Dee Dee. She just had paper plates, put them on the floor with numbers one from 10, and then would give each person a different sequence of numbers. So one person gets two, four, six, eight. The next person may get 10, eight, six, four. And they have to find each plate and heal from it. And it's a good exercise because you have to focus on where you're going, which is the same as listening to your judge when they're calling you a healing pattern. And it realistically is how we are when we're in the ring. It's a very good exercise for you to practice with your dog on a somewhat regular basis. Someone has to do it for you, though. Otherwise, we're, we cheat. <laughs> yes, I can watch a healing pattern for 10 dogs and then step in the ring and realize I wasn't really watching the healing pattern. I was just watching the performance. So I've had to just get used to doing it on the fly kind of thing much easier if you know the pattern though. I think a very big thing is we're all doing this because we love our dogs. We want to do things with our dogs and it's fun. This is our hobby. It's our stress release from work. But sometimes though, getting some of these upper level, level titles, it's extremely demanding on both you and your dog. It's a lot of work, a lot of practice. There's frustration involved when things aren't going your way. So if things haven't been going as planned, make sure you just are aware of your dog's mental health. Make sure they're getting walks on the beach, hikes, those moments where you're getting out of their head to counterbalance it. So I have a trial coming up very soon for Harry. It's a Saturday, so a couple of days from now. He, Jill and I just took him to the beach. He ran around. Yesterday, he went on a big hour plus long hike. So did he the day before. So I'm not sacrificing his time where he 
needs it to decompress and just enjoy being a dog. The extra work is added on top of that. I can't just cheat and pull away that time from him. Likewise, when we're done trial, the following days, there will be no work for Harry. It will only be hikes and being a dog because they need a break too. Like it's a lot of work getting ready for a trial, even if we fall flat in our faces. <laughs> and he still deserves this time now in advance but to make sure that he's still in a really good place and enjoying his life fully. And then he needs those days afterward coming down to make sure that he's still in that same place. Yep, definitely. I think that's one of the most important pieces, I think. Because if everything's good between me and Harry, he's going to dig deep for me and give me extra even if I fail. I've seen it so many times. I'm jinxing myself right now by saying this. (laughs) I'm going to regret these words. But if he's able to, he will cover for me if I am taking care of his mental health in advance. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not a bad thing to have your own head in a good space with those hikes and walks on the beach. If you're stressing about the upcoming trial as well, the dogs pick up on that. So the two of you being in a good head space is where you want to start out. And I think head space is perspective. I had, I was training Johnny for three years with iliopsoas injury and it would get better i could train him it would get worse it would get better i could train him it would get worse and then at age of 3 i put him in for his temperament test so his base level title and realized that that was it that's as far as he was going his leg couldn't even do that level so that was before jumping is involved and having to retire a dog that you're so attached to at that age is absolutely devastating. So here I am now with Harry. Harry's that same age right now. I really don't care how he does. I don't get me wrong. I do. But I'm so glad that I just get to go out there with Harry. That's the important part. I know I can fix stuff, but I'm not going to wait till it's perfect for Harry because what if he too injures himself right away and then I never get to trial with Harry. So I'm going before we're ready. I know that. He knows that whatever. I don't have ridiculous expectations. I'm just glad I get to go try with my dog. Yep. Yep. Spend time with your dog. That's what it's all about. Perspective is everything. Yep. Now, if we start getting ready for bigger competitions, then yes, I need to have him a lot better prepared than he is right now. But right now, I'm just grateful that I get to go do this with my dog. You don't go to Worlds or the NOC or the NOI with a dog that's not ready. When you're in those big competitions, you yeah, you want them to be ready to take on the challenge. But for his little local trial, we just need our lowest scores to get through. <laughs> 72, here you come. <laughs> I need my nice low score so long as he's happy. So long as he's happy and working with me in the right emotion. If I have the foundation pieces correct, the rest I can build. Yep. But if I'm dragging him in there as an unwilling participant, then no, that's not how it should be done. Yeah. Your thoughts, you had talked to me about this with Sizzle, my my, my challenging child. Squizzle. Yes. When I finally went in the ring with her, your recommendation was to do one trial and then wait. I can't even remember what you said, a month, a few weeks or a month before I put her in again. Rather than, I'm going to just throw her in three trials in one weekend and see what happens and hope I get my title. Explain your thoughts on that. It does depend on the dog because some dogs right away are just ready to go for it. But my Italian greyhound, I think probably was the one that taught me this, of just do one trial a weekend, let her get her feet wet a little bit, let her have a super good experience without leaving that show completely fatigued because I asked too much of her mentally. Then I gave her a break. And with Mandy, Italian Greyhound, it took time to get her back in the mood and make her love it again after I'd asked something for her. So we had time to fix any issues that may have been created by trial. We got to have our fun again and then would try another class again. So we we had gaps at the beginning to get to build up her stamina, to introduce her to competition. Eventually, I was able to compete with her, I think, four times a weekend. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we could ever do more than four a weekend. She didn't have the mental stamina for it. 
Harry, I wouldn't hesitate right now entering him at all four in a weekend. He, it would be easy for him, different dogs. Yeah. But for Sizzle, who struggles with environment, with stress, one a weekend and let her leave feeling super about herself, you'd be way further ahead in her career down the road because yeah. she won't have that bad experience to think about. Not that it would have been bad, but it would have been fatiguing and tiring. Well, and she, that's not what you want her leaving that trial with. And she might have thought it was bad. I also, you taught me to go in there and regardless of what she does, make sure she feels good about herself. Yes. So I had to just have my job in hand and I knew what I needed to do if things started to fall apart. So your less confident dogs or environmental dogs, a better idea to go slow rather than try to blast your way through it. Yep. Take your time and make sure they leave there thinking that they are the best dog at that trial. Yeah. No matter what. If they I hate to say this because so many people just assume their dog was dissing them, but there are times where our dogs do misbehave, but they are the rarity, not the norm. Most of the errors are effort errors, or they just didn't fully understand an exercise, or we haven't properly prepared them by removing food. So when the food was all gone, they started to worry when they didn't get a piece after healing and thought they'd done something wrong. It's generally things like that, like our lack of preparedness to get them to this point. Make sure that dog knows that they are the best dog there, even if they did come down on their second exercise because they didn't get rewarded from the first one. Yeah. Then your praise has to increase. If you have to replace your food with just verbal praise. But not, <laughs> make sure it's heartfelt praise, yes. not just words in a high-pitched voice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you must believe what you say. You cannot lie to a dog. Yeah. Anything else, Jill? No, I think that's a lot of tips. As we all come into trial season, good luck, enjoy, and have fun with your dogs. Absolutely. Most important part, have fun. Yes, I agree. Thank you for listening. All right. See you next Tuesday.